you. It's a great pleasure to, to talk to you today about uh, adoptive cell therapy for, for cancer. So this is something that's been uh, developed for some time, uh, but it's now looking really, really promising in many aspects. I'll just briefly overview the immune system and cancer, the ways that we can uh, intervene and uh, how we, there are different ways of doing adoptive cell therapy, either using natural T cells or engineered T cells, and what we've learned, some positive and some, some negative, but how it's leading to how we're going to develop this further forward in the, in the future. So this is just a brief overview of, uh, of a the immune system and cancer. So there are many ways you can uh, intervene, either through things like dendritic cell vaccines, through cytokines that activate uh, T cells, uh, blocking of, of regulatory T cells or, uh, and modulation of, of uh, negative uh, regulators, things like uh, anti-CTLA-4 and, and uh, nivolumab and, and, and so on. And also that you can use direct uh, T cell therapy. Obviously, the aim of the immune system is to generate either antibodies or, or, or cytotoxic T cells that can destroy uh, the tumors. So the other approach that I'm going to talk about today is directly using these cells as a, as a therapy. I suppose that one key thing is that uh, it's been known for a long time that the infiltration of immune cells within the tumor correlates with the outcome. So the more uh, T cells you have in the tumor, uh, the, more, the better the, the outcome in terms of this shows uh, colorectal uh, cancer here in terms of disease-free survival. So the more uh, T cells you have in, in, the, in, the, in the tumor, the better the progression-free survival. Showing on there, so uh, next one. Okay, try again. Oh, okay. Or in terms of overall, oops, or, or in terms of overall survival, or in terms of overall survival uh, shown here. Um, and that, I suppose, what is the question? Is that cause and effect? Uh, and what are these T cells recognizing? Are they just there for some irrelevant reason or are they recognizing something specific? And we'll come back to that. And I suppose one, one other key thing is that we know immunotherapy can work. There's a lot of excitement at the moment that this is actually one of the first immunotherapies uh, licensed interleukin-2, which we still use to treat uh, kidney cancer because although there are many other treatments, nothing else produces complete remissions which are durable like this. So the, these are patients who've undergone just, uh, just treatment with interleukin-2 and have achieved a complete remission and the vast majority have never relapsed. Those who have only partial remissions or, or no response obviously fare much less uh, well. Again, the question is how, how is this working? It's, act it's activating T cells, but we're not sure exactly what they, they recognize. And I'll come back to that at the end. In terms of adoptive T cell therapy, I suppose we're talking about two approaches. One is the use of natural T cells that recognize um, the tumor that can be isolated either from the blood or the tumor or genetically engineered cells that you can make uh, by different ways of engineering T cells that I'll describe in more detail later. But essentially, however you do it, the cells are isolated from the patient, engineered, and then returned to the patient as a treatment. This goes back a, a, long, a long way. The first uh, uh, treatments were done in the early uh, 90s by Steve Rosenberg at the NCI, where they took uh, melanoma patients, excised tumor, grew up uh, T cells, and they had various different protocols, but they were all fairly similar in, in essence, and they returned the cells to the patient. That was um, relatively ineffective. There were some benefits from it, but they were mostly short-lived. Short and probably the reason for that is that these cells actually survive a very short time when they're reinfused, they, they die and, and, dis and disappear. So the thing that really uh, changed was actually based on a very early paper 
and this was an animal model, where they tried different combinations of either just cells alone, uh, cells plus chemotherapy, or uh, chemotherapy plus cells plus interleukin-2, and the only group of, uh, of uh, animals that had long-term survival had, were pre-treated with chemotherapy and then followed with cells and, and, uh, and cytokines. So that led to the evolving uh, process where, where in the 1990s the responses were quite low uh, and, and not very durable. And those more recently in, in the years since about 2009-10 where they've had long-term durable remissions and much higher response rates. The basic process is essentially very, very similar, but the big difference is that they used preconditioning uh, chemotherapy to alter the, the immune system of the patient prior to introducing the, the T cells to the patient. And so I says, why do you do that? And I suppose that the reason seems to be uh, multiple. You're, you're eliminating so-called regulatory T cells, T cells that may suppress the immune uh, effect. Um, when, when you deplete uh, lymphocytes from a, a patient or a mouse, you uh, that there's so-called homeostatic cytokines, things like IL-7, IL-15, which are upregulated, and they encourage the proliferation and the engraftment of the cells that you've introduced. And there's also no competition uh, from, the, from the cells that are, were there in the, in, the, in the first place. You may also enhance uh, a variety of other indirect methods, but the first two are probably the most important. And this just illustrates what, what happens. This just is a, a typical uh, blood count. Patients are given uh, chemotherapy and their, both their neutrophils and their lymphocytes uh, disappear for around uh, five, five to 10 days. Uh, after five or 10 days, they, they have rapid uh, recovery of their, of their neutrophil uh, count and their, their total uh, white count, and al but also their, their lymphocyte count uh, rapidly uh, recovers. And these are essentially the cells that have been reinfused into the patient. Those were not there in the, those are not the cells that, have, that are, were in the patient in the first place. If you didn't give cells back, there would be a very low level and a very, very gradual recovery over a period of, uh, of months, not of days. And this just illustrates the outcome that you can achieve. These are patients treated at, at the NCI with a very high uh, response rate and quite uh, durable in, in many in many patients, I suppose we've been trying. We've been setting this up uh, locally uh, in our uh, practice in, in Manchester, and I suppose we, we've done it in a slightly different way. We've done it in a in a, in a fully GMP compliant method, where the, the cells are manipulated in uh, isolators, and the advantage of isolators over clean rooms is that you can um, these can be sterilized very quickly. So you can actually process uh, cells in parallel, uh, several patients at the same time. Whereas if you have a clean room, you need an open process. You need to uh, have a clean room per patient, which is excessively expensive. Also, there have been improved methods of expanding the cells. And we use the uh, wave bioreactor, but there are other bioreactors to expand the cells in a more automated way than would have been done in the past. And this just illustrates one of the patients. This was a young man. He had tumor actually excised from uh, a lung metastasis and a brain metastasis to grow uh, the T cells from him. And he had a uh, large tumor in the middle of his chest, which was making him breathless, uh, compressing his bronchi here. And that was it after about uh, six months. And, it and that's barely, barely detectable. It's continued to disappear. And he's now three years out with no evidence of disease. He also had a, a brain metastasis, was, which was actually growing. As I said, he had some other brain metastasis resected. That also shrank uh, down and, and disappeared and never, uh, never recurred. So you can get good responses in, in all sites of disease, essentially. So, so far, we, we've harvested uh, cells from uh, 30 patients. There's been 90% of those have been successful. Not all patients have been treated, some because they're just keeping them for the future, for, for future use. They don't actually need to be treated yet. Some, unfortunately, it's been too late for them to be treated, so they've not been well enough to have treatment when the cells have been grown. They've been, we've treated a variety of melanoma uh, patients, and they've all had uh, manageable 
Uh, side effects are generally in hospital uh, two, two to three uh, weeks, and they have uh, no clear toxicity related to the patients. This shows the patients with uh, skin uh, melanoma who uh, have a most of them respond. Two have had complete remissions out of the, the nine. All, many of the others have responded, although not uh, all. Uh, but most of these are very durable, and some of the partial remissions are very durable, uh, but some of the partial remissions uh, progress. But this just shows the overall uh, survival outcome. So again, there are long-term survivors. The numbers are very, uh, very small at this point, but there still are very long-term uh, survivors who are free of disease. The current our current strategy with this is that it, it is we are, are able to use this treatment through a, a specials license uh, process. Uh, the aim is to uh, increase uh, the activity and, and to treat more, more patients, but also to improve the product. I suppose the process at present is relatively uh, inefficient. Uh, it, the, there's uncertainty in the initial uh, period of, of growth, and that could probably be streamlined to pick out better cells. I think one issue is that currently the cells are used uh, both transported to the laboratory fresh and back to the patient fresh. So that limits the, the distance from the uh, processing laboratory. Um, and so, but clearly that could be done as either frozen or cold uh, transport of cells. And there's a variety of ways that I'll, I'll talk about later to engineer cells that we could improve the efficacy. That moves us on to the engineering of, of, of T cells. And the, the process has developed over, over many years. The first approach is just to introduce the alpha and beta chain that uh, recognize a target that you want into the T cells uh, that are nonspecific. Um, there are a variety of uh, different uh, ways of uh, constructing the T cell receptor. And this is just one way that links the T cell receptor to the zeta chain. Uh, directly rather than uh, indirectly. Um, the more, uh, the more uh, novel approach, if you like, is to use a, an antibody, so an antibody that recognizes a tumor-associated antigen linked to a, a signal-transducing domain of, a, uh, of the T-cell receptor, and that's so-called T-bodies or car chimeric antigen receptors that were first described by uh, Zelig Eschar. You can uh, adapt that to provide co-stimulation, so that's the second signal that the T cell needs, and that can also be uh, targeted either independently of the T cell receptor or together with the T cell receptor, and that produces the so-called second generation CAR, which links an antibody to uh, both signal transducing domains. So that's, uh, that's been the gradual evolution, and you can imagine there are multiple you can make a third generation that has two of these and, and so on. Um, I, but I think the second generation is, is uh, so far is the one that's been used most in the clinic. So the general technology then is to take a, 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 a natural T cell with no particular specificity uh, and to gene modify the cells using a, usually a virus, usually a lentivirus or a retrovirus, but it can in potential potentially be uh, plasmid DNA or any other method of introducing uh, genes into the cells. And so we can target uh, defined targets either through the T cell receptor or through other processes. There are a variety of different antigens that you can potentially target. Differentiation antigens, which are on normal tissues but uh, overexpressed on tumors. Some that are on non-essential tissues, such as CD19 on B cells. Uh, thyroglobulin on thyroid. Um, you can have uh, non-mutated antigens that seem to be unique to the cancers uh, and to the testis, so-called cancer testis antigens. I suppose shared mutations of which there are not as many found as we think there perhaps ought to be, but these are, these are, uh, there are many intracellular ones, but these are extracellular ones on the surface, so there are relatively few of those, but there may be more. Obviously, viral antigens are, are potentially uh, unique, and there are true uh, unique uh, mutations within the tumor, which may either be uh, driver mutations or just maybe passenger mutations, which happen to be there. But they, either way, they can potentially be recognized by the immune system. So we've tested uh, some of these things in animal models. This shows our animal model of, uh, of, CD, of CD19 targeting uh, molecule. So 
One issue is how you test these best in, in animals. Um, if you use human T cells, um, that's obviously what you're going to use in the patient, um, but that's not uh, really a very good biological model. Doesn't give you a readout of toxicity. Doesn't give you a readout of how they may traffic. Um, the, the best model for that is a truly mouse model where you have mouse T cells targeting a mouse antigen in a normal mouse. Obviously, there may be a drawback in that, that not all antigens are completely homologous between a mouse and, and a human, but in the case of CD19, uh, they are very similar in the way they're expressed in, in both uh, normal B cells and, uh, and, in, and in tumors. So this just illustrates one of the models. So this was the human T cells. So this was a very similar approach to the approach we used. We had established B cell tumors. We pre-treated the mice with uh, chemotherapy and then followed it with uh, T cells. And in only in that group, not in the group who had chemotherapy or T cells alone, did we see long-term survival. But in the group who had both, we did see long-term survival. If we did the better biological model here, where we uh, do a, this is a mouse lymphoma, a true mouse lymphoma, which is well established, and then the, the mouse is pretreated with a, um, so either chemotherapy or, or radiation, and then the T cells are given and then followed. And this just shows a remarkable effect with either low dose or high dose of cells. You completely eradicate all, all tumors, whereas you don't here with a, something that a, a mouse construct that targets CD19 but doesn't signal. And this just shows imaging of, of mice with uh, widespread. Uh, lymphoma leukemia, which is eradicated and doesn't recur. So uh, trials have been set up on, on the, a very similar basis to the uh, TIL approach, to the tumor infiltrating lymphocyte approach. But the difference here is that you're not taking na natural T cells. We're engineering in uh, specificity. We're using the same type of uh, preconditioning, slight variations, but the same sort of type and the, the process of production is uh, similar, although not identical. And this just shows one of the patients with a follicular lymphoma who, uh, who had quite extensive lymph node disease, had failed prior transplants, uh, and this just illustrates one of the gradual response over, over a year of, of gradually shrinking uh, tumor. This is a much larger tumor in a different type of lymphoma, a mantle, a mantle cell uh, lymphoma, a very large tumor. This is after uh, 12 weeks and it's gradually still uh, shrinking is now 12 months after treatment. Um, this, this just illustrates the survival of the cells in, in, in the patients. And these are different cohorts. These are different doses of, of cells between the two. I think what's interesting is, although there are uh, differences, actually the differences between the patients are, are more than the differences between the the uh, dose groups, and there's a tenfold difference in cells between these two, but because you get this homeostatic expansion, it doesn't actually seem to make any clear uh, difference. I guess there will be a threshold. If we took it down too low, they maybe couldn't expand, but certainly within the dose range we see, we don't see any clear, uh, clear difference in, in uh, persistence of the cells. So, in, so this is just to summarize that trial, which is now uh, really finished. So the first generation receptor, it was quite low doses of chemotherapy. So the patients are less, uh, there's less toxicity from the chemotherapy. There was, a, although I said there was no difference in survival, there did seem to be a slight difference in response rate, whether that's true or just a reflection of uh, small numbers. I suppose we're not uh, entirely sure, but certainly there was high uh, responses and generally very low uh, toxicity, although some patients do get a transient neurotoxicity, which is probably uh, related to uh, cytokine release. This is a different approach by one of our, some of our colleagues, um, um, Carl Jun, who's uh, done a, a second generation receptor in ALL, and there they've got long-term uh, survivors and very high uh, response rates. I suppose a different approach is in solid tumors. This, this is a tumor, uh, this is a tumor antigen in, uh, in colorectal, or in GI tumors, uh, CEA. And there, the trial has been less happy when we gave large doses of the, of the cells. Um, there was um, quite severe toxicity with lung toxicity. And we weren't entirely sure why that was. The expression is very, very low in normal lung 
there may, there may be some there, and that may have been enough to trigger it. Um, and this just shows what we. Rose again. can do more than one infusion, but I suppose generally we've done one in the sense that the problem is if you have to give chemotherapy again, then you destroy the, the cells that were, were there. So I think that's the problem, unless you could somehow make them resistant to chemotherapy. Is there any opportunity, though, uh, or is there any knowledge or, or engineering about when they're reinfused, uh, multiple ablation, the response of the tumor to the second or third infusion, and the potential for toxicity if they're successful? I don't think there's been any more toxicity, but there can be uh, there can be repeat responses a second time around. Yeah, 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 there can be. Yeah. No, it doesn't seem to be. What about um, our treatment with uh, cytokines in the past in protein two uh, prior uh, T cell activity? Um, I mean, there are you can p possibly grow them in different cytokines. There may be advantages in growing them in IL seven, IL fifteen. People speculate that's being tested in the clinic. It's not clear in, in animal models. It does appear to be beneficial. Um, this just shows the type of toxicity we see, saw in this trial with quite diffuse lung infiltrates, uh, which do eventually completely uh, resolve. Um, and we're really unclear entirely what the mechanism was at the time. Uh, but there was certainly no toxicity on immediate infusion, which suggested it wasn't the cells just going straight to the lung. Um, I suppose what we think is happening is that the, when you culture uh, alveo lung alveolar cells in, um, in, in, in cytokines, you see an upregulation of, of CEA when you culture an interferon gamma. And that's shown here that a proportion of the cells quite markedly upregulate interfere on gamma expression, that may be what you're seeing, that the, there is very, very low levels of, uh, of, uh, uh, of CEA in the lung, which is upregulated uh, through the uh, expression of, of cytokines and through the homeostatic expansion. So that may be the mechanism that's ha happening. I suppose the other approach is to take the natural T cells and here again, there's been a similar story. With some, you can get good responses and mild toxicity. With some, you get severe toxicity, and this shows a sort of what looks like graft-versus-host disease, and it's a really bad skin uh, reaction here. Again, it does settle down. Uh, it does show they're very active. There's very low levels of Mark I in normal skin, but it does cause a problem, whereas other targets seem to be uh, much, much safer. So I suppose the, the overall summary of that situation is that normal tissue is expression is really important. High levels, obviously, a problem. Easy access might be a problem. The, there's uh, reports with uh, CA9 on, on liver, which is easily ac accessed, uh, which does give toxicity, whereas polarized CEA on the bowel, for example, we didn't see any bowel toxicity with our antibody-based receptors. Other uh, tissues, even with low low level uh, expression in critical tissues like heart or lung. You see, see severe toxicity if you target HER2 uh, with T cells and possibly upregulation during the, the process as we've seen. And there may even be cross-reactive antigens has been seen when people have targeted MAGE A3. So these are just some summaries of these look quite promising, certainly haven't been problems with them yet. These have been, there have been problems with current processes. Maybe the processes can be adapted. But there are issues about the affinity and, and, and the expression level and the location. So where are we we're going with this? So many uh, tumor cells uh, do appear to have uh, selective targets. And the T cells are very, very powerful. The tumor infiltrating lymphocytes illustrate that. And the, the, the outcome is, is good, and they are effective and relatively non-toxic in, in melanoma. Uh, so what do they recognize? And there, again, it is 
beginning to emerge that probably a lot of them are recognizing truly mutated targets which are truly tumor specific, uh, these uh, targets here. And that's emerging. This shows from um, exome sequencing of various tumors. Many tumors have quite large numbers of mutations. Melanoma, it's particularly high. Lung cancer is very high. Colorectal cancer is very high. So these are obviously associated with uh, carcinogens. It may be less common in, in these other in other tumors, but even these have quite large numbers of mutations in total. And <laughs> ah, ah, success. And and there are ways where you can I identify uh, those. So when you isolate uh, tumor cells and sequence them, you can identify the mutations and then predict for uh, T cell epitopes using algorithms and then screen for tumors that, uh, for uh, T cells that recognize those peptides. And that's illustrated here where a tumor has been sequenced, several theoretical peptides have been identified, and then the, the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes have been screened uh, to identify uh, individual uh, peptides that are recognized by the, the, the TIL, uh, and this is for just one HLA type. So if you did all HLA types, you'd expect to find uh, multiple different targets. It's also been done with other cancers, and in most cases, you can find targets. So I suppose that the current situation is that adoptive cell therapy is quite eff is effective. It is quite a complex treatment, uh, and it is personalized, so the the bar to uh, kind of uh, getting it adopted is, is relatively higher. Um, but the main attractions are, are that you can manipulate the cells outside the body uh, a, away from immunological controls. The drawbacks are that it's, uh, it's relatively uh, costly, but this, these processes are greatly improving and potentially can be automated to a large, large extent. And also the issues that I alluded to of rolling it out to multiple centers. So overall, I would say engineered T cell therapy, the key uh, challenges are that it's potentially very effective. Some targets are clearly identified. CD19 looks really, really good in many uh, B cell uh, malignancies. Uh, trials are ongoing in a number of other targets, but there is always a risk of non-target toxicity, and it's quite hard to predict, really, b uh, before you do a trial. I mean, there's some cases where you can possibly predict it, but in many cases, people have been uh, surprised. But certainly, as targets get identified, uh, then there'll be there's a clear <laughs> method of evaluating them. Till therapy it seems to be extremely effective in, in melanoma. Again, that's being standardized. The key issue is that probably they're, they're targeting multiple antigens. Probably they're truly specific, so that's why you don't see much uh, toxicity from the, the cells. In principle, it should be active across a wide range of tumors, but I'm sure there will be variation between patients. Those who have, maybe patients who have higher numbers of mutations will have a higher chance of being recognized. Those with a lower number, lower chance of being recognized. And it obviously depends a matter of chance where those mutations are. But the processes are getting better and they're likely to be standardized. And I think the key is that these are truly specific and so you can potentially enhance their activity further. So these are just the people involved. So this is our cellular therapy uh, unit, which is run by uh, Ryan uh, Guest um, and that's now spun out as a, as a, as a company. And uh, Dave Gillam is the main person in the university who's done the, the pre, all of the preclinical uh, work and there's large uh, clinical teams doing various different uh, trials uh, as well, including our currently ongoing EU trials. So thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, well, I suppose there are, there are some toxicities. Certainly, if you don't, certainly the cytokine release type effects. I mean, that is a is a almost uh, unavoidable effect of an effective therapy. Um, there are ways that you can modulate that. I think people have seen that IL six, for example, is uh, seems to be very important, and anti IL six antibodies can uh, uh, ameliorate the the toxicity. 
I suppose there may be ways of, of getting around that as well, possibly by fractionating the, the dose of, of cells or giving it slightly uh, differently. Um, I suppose it, 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 you also want to make sure um, as, as far as possible that the, 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 the tumor, the, the target isn't on a really critical organ. That you can get away with a B cell target. That's not a problem. The patients are, are without B cells for many months or, or years. Uh, and that's not a problem. But if, you, if, like I said, if it's on your heart, that's uh, not so good. You can't put up with much uh, toxicity there. So it's I mean, suicide genes can be uh, introduced. Obviously, the, the uh, I mean, I suppose the, the problem with a, su a straightforward suicide, well, some of the toxicity can be extremely quick. Mm -hmm. Patient with HER2 uh, toxicity died within uh, hours of, of, of treatment. So it can be very fast and it would be difficult for a T cell receptor. I, s I suppose, um, you know, in these early trials, it may be advantageous to have one. I guess ultimately, if you really need to use it, it's not going to be a very practical uh, therapy, but it is a way of testing out th these things in early stage. Yeah, I mean, I think that may be more, uh, I suppose the, you know, you may have the very high levels of expression of the receptor on T cells is, is, is increases the toxicity. If you could uh, control that expression, then that would be better than uh, depleting the cells completely. Because if you, if you use a, an effective suicide gene, you effectively uh, remove any possibility of benefit as, as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, all, all of those things exist. Um, and some, some have been in, introduced into trials, but not, I don't think many have actually been used in, in anger as yet in, in the face of real toxicity. Yeah, and some, I mean, in some of these patients, the, the, the cells certainly persist for a long time and they do appear to have a memory phenotype or some of the cells appear to have a memory phenotype. So. Uh, um, well, it, I mean, it's not been done in, in, in patients. I think in, in mice, you can re-treat uh, mice and, and yeah, re-challenge uh, re them with tumours. I mean, yeah, that, that is a, a risk that the tum there is a, a, a increasing diversity of the tumour as time goes on. And I suppose in most cases, till therapy, which effectively is using those cells, is done um, near, to the, near to the time of treatment. Some, sometimes we, we've harvested them six months or even a year in advance, but not sort of not many years uh, in, in advance. So that that is a, an uncertainty. You may need to re-harvest at, at, a, at a later date. Um, you may be able to get these cells from peripheral blood as well. Uh, it may not be necessary. I mean, they're enriched in the tumor, but they're there in peripheral blood. It's just a question of uh, enriching them in a different way. I don't have, I mean, we know that months is, is fine. Um, we know that uh, certainly uh, six months is, is, is absolutely fine. And that's Some of the yeah. 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 And, I, and I guess the, 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 the point is that they're probably, I think, you, where you have a single, if, if you were targeting a single epitope, that would be much more of a problem. But if you're targeting multiple epitopes, may, you know, maybe 10 or 20, then sure, one or two of them may be maybe not there, but as long as the others are there, you're okay. <laughs>